Amen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you didn't give it to that one, if, if that didn't dry your kindling, nothing will. We're uh, grateful for Mr. Clyde and his gifts and providing that beautiful voluntary opening to the service. And as we have gathered on this Palm Sunday, it's hard to believe it's only a week until Easter. And we have to go through this week and remember all that our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ did for us to get to the joyous celebration of next Sunday, and it is in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ I say to you each, good morning. Thank you so much for being here, and please allow me to remind you of a few things. We will have a quarterly meeting this evening in the fellowship hall. Please note that and and join us if you can. And also, I have an urgent plea for this Wednesday... April the 13th, we have a blood drive here from 2.30 to 6.30, and we need volunteers to assist with that. If you are willing to uh, be involved in that, please contact the office, and we can make arrangements for you to be involved in it. Remember our Holy Week services this Thursday evening at 6.30, and then on Good Friday, we have a very special Good Friday cantata that Blaine is going to come forward in just a moment to share some information with you. Keep those in mind and notice our Easter morning schedule. The sunrise service which occurs at Forest Hill Cemetery is at 7. Then we will gather here for for breakfast, our morning study, fellowship time, and then the worship service at 10. And there's a great deal planned for next Sunday, so we hope that you will come out. And also as we have in the past several years, we ask each person, each one invite one. We want to have a wonderful worship service and we want as many people as possible to be able to share in that. So invite someone to come with you and worship next Sunday. I'd also like to give a special thank you to those that were involved in the Palm Sunday workshop on Thursday evening. I'll go ahead and tell you, if you've not been involved in that, you miss a lot of fun. It is um, maybe some fun we shouldn't have, but still, it was a good time, and hope you will appreciate these palm crosses today to wear in honor of Palm Sunday. And there's still time, if you would like to give in honor or memory of someone for the Easter lilies for next Sunday, please do so, as they will be in our sanctuary as a part of our worship service. So now I'm going to ask Blaine to come forward and share with you some thoughts about Friday evening, and then I will lead you in the call to worship. Good morning. Just wanted to take an um, opportunity to mention the Good Friday service. As Kenny said, you know, Easter is just a week away, and about two weeks ago I was like, Easter is just two weeks away. I was like, Easter is just two weeks away. (laughs) Um, But the choir has been working very hard um, to prepare the music for Good Friday. Um, And they have done a fantastic job along with our musicians. And we'll have some guest instrumentalists that evening as well. So I do hope you will make plans to join us for that service Um, to ultimately come and to journey to the cross together, but also to to hear the music that is being prepared for you. So we hope you will um, join us that evening. Thank you. Thank you, Blaine. And it is a, a beautiful, beautiful musical presentation, and I look forward to that. Please join us Friday evening and invite others to come and worship with you. I ask you now to join with me and let's prepare our hearts as we prepare for the procession of the palms. If you will join with me in the call to worship and then Blaine will lead us in the processional hymn. Jesus rides into Jerusalem. All right, y'all, give it some gusto. There's an exclamation point there. Branches are waved, people shout. There you go. Hopes and dreams are running along with the parade. Shout and sing for joy, the Lord comes. Hosanna in the highest. Come, now is the time of dancing and joy. Hosanna in the highest. Now is the time of victory. 
For the Lord comes into our lives. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. y'all for doing such a good job this morning. You came in waving these. What are these? Palms, that's right. Palm leaves, palm, palm fronds, palm branches. There's many things that you can call them, but we're doing this because it's a special Sunday. We're remembering when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, and as he entered into the city, there were people waving palm fronds at him and saying, Hosanna, come on, take your time, (laughs) this is probably the only time she walks, (laughs) Um, Hosanna, saying save us because they saw him as the Messiah and they were excited, that meant God's chosen one, well, All that excitement will change a little later in the week when we will think about what Christ did for us on the cross. Yes. But right now we're thinking about this excitement of Jesus entering Jerusalem. And today you get to do something special. Look, look, listen. Look, look. You get to do something special in children's time you're going to make Jesus on a donkey. And he runs. I don't have, have a flat, good surface to do this. So I don't want to. But if you, you take him, look, and you pull him back like this, and off he goes, going down, and he came in on a donkey. So you're going to get to make one of these. And I know the children workers are excited about putting these together. Um, see, Carson, Carson's really excited. And... So I want you to think about that today while you're making this. Look, here, look. Remember, Jesus came in. Everybody was excited to see him. But later on, things kind of went badly. And they turned against him because he wasn't going to do exactly what they wanted. 
So we need to remember this triumphant time, but also remember the sacrifice that we're going to celebrate this week, and then next Sunday will be Easter. So let's have a prayer, and you, and you, get, to go, you get to go back, okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, the beauty of your creation, and for our Savior, Jesus Christ, as we remember all that he did for us. We thank you for these children and ask you to watch over us and bless us as we prepare for the week ahead. Amen. Our reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, Psalms, chapter 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfastness love endures forever. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all you have blessed us with, that you bestow upon us each and every day, Lord. We are here this morning to worship you, during this season, as we know, as the beginning of your son's journey as he is to be crucified and becomes our Savior, we are so thankful to have him in our hearts. Guide us each and every day, Lord, to seek your will in our everyday activities. And also, Lord, let us pray what your son has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In this season of Lent, we reflect on our journey of faith with Christ, remembering that long ago God planted the tree of life, and yet it is on a tree that Christ is crucified. We are again reminded that life comes out of death, and we are promised that death does not have the final word. We light this candle on this Palm Sunday, the last Sunday of Lent, remembering God's faithfulness through the cross upon which our Lord was crucified, that death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more.
for Christ triumphs over death. As the days lengthen, dear God, may we remember that you are the one who calls life out of death, that you are the Lord of our lives. In the name of Christ, may we have the strength found in him to journey toward the cross. Amen. I just want to tell everybody thank you for all the prayers. I couldn't have done it without you. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for all us being here. We just thank you for everything we have. In these tithes and offers we took today, hope we further your kingdom. And we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> as I share with you each morning, um, Sunday morning as the service is opening, I always seem to overlook the flowers for the day, try to remember to share them, especially so that those who are streaming with us may be aware 
and I cannot miss today's flowers because I would be in trouble, um, and I'm still kind of in shock that it's happening, but in the next several months, if you're driving, beware. The flowers are placed in the sanctuary to the glory of God in the honor of James Andrew Bird's 15th birthday. His mother and I placed these in his honor. Um, I still remember him running around for the first 10 years of his life with a pacifier in his mouth. And now he's a grown, growing boy. But uh, we are so grateful for the many different aspects he brings to our lives at the birdhouse, we will say. Now as we prepare our hearts for a time of prayer, I must say how wonderful it was to see Butch up here praying, and we're glad that he's improving and doing well. You look very distinguished with the cane, Butch, so that's, um, we pray that he will continue to grow strong, and um, we pray for both he and Claudia as they move it forward. Continue to remember um, Miss Annie Jackson in your prayers. She had some issues over the past week and um, is slowly doing uh, improving. But, uh, please continue to remember her. Please continue to remember Miss Linda Cooper. She had a um, procedure this past week, and we pray that it will, will help her in all that she's been dealing with. Continue to remember Teresa Bartholomew in your prayers as she is recuperating after um, surgery, a very uh, serious surgery, but she is doing well and little by little is growing stronger. So please keep all of these in your prayers and the many names that are on our prayer concerns list. We pray that the Lord will watch over them. And now as we prepare our hearts for a a moment of prayer I want to share with you. Key verse for this day that we celebrate, Palm Sunday, from the Gospel of Luke. In the 19th chapter, verses 28 through 40, where we hear the, the retelling of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying the colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Please hear now this call to confession during this Lenten season and this final Sunday of Lent as I have asked that we look into our hearts and, and seek to draw closer to God during this time, finding those things which may come between us and our commitment to Christ. So prepare your hearts now for a time of confession and then please hear the pastoral prayer. It is difficult when things are not what we want. The people were shouting, blessed, as Christ entered Jerusalem, wanted a Savior, but on their terms. Who is the Christ that we want? Join in prayer and seek forgiveness. Let us pray.
What a joy it is to celebrate the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. The disciples gathered the colt for him to ride. People shouted, Hosanna, waved palm branches and placed their cloaks in the path of the colt. Even when some were cautious, Jesus reminded them that the stones would sing out. For triumph was truly coming to the holy city. Triumph in a way they couldn't imagine. So we today, we, we wave our palms, we sing and shout Hosanna. We want Jesus to ride into all the places of tension and anger in our lives. We want Jesus to heal the hurts and establish his reign of peace forever. The parade is a, a good thing. It is not to be discounted as unimportant to the events ahead. We need to shout with joy and let the shouts ring in our hearts. We pray, gracious Lord, that you bring us hope where we have allowed fear and confusion to reside. Bring us healing where we've been wounded or have wounded others by our thoughts, our words, and deeds. Bring us peace where we have been bombarded by anger and separation. Bring us with you into the holy city, not made with human hands, but in your heaven above. Amen. Thank you, Karen, for that beautiful piece to settle our spirits, our hearts, and our minds as we move now into this time of worship. And this morning, I, I bring to you the second to the last sermon in this sermon series entitled, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, drawing on the thoughts of the chaos that seems to exist and has existed throughout time in different periods. And there have been moments when it has seemed to, of course, be more so than at other times. And as we stand in this chaotic time right now, as a war on the other side of the world affects us more than we may realize, and as we continue to remember the people of Ukraine and all that they're facing, daily we hear of the many things that are occurring. And we also may think that right here in our own nation, there's so much chaos and, and things are unsettled. Yet I want us to look back to a time, as I have shared over the past many weeks in history 
when it, it truly was a chaotic period, maybe even more so than now, I've talked about a gentleman named Benedict. This is a, a likeness of him, uh, probably a bit romanticized. He has in his hands a book. It has a regula on it, which in Latin means order or rule. And he's famous for something called the rule of St. Benedict. He, in essence, codified, put into writing the guidelines for drawing from the world, cloistering yourself in a community of believers, of men called monks. And he created this at a time when the world around them seemed to be falling apart. The Roman Empire in the West had fallen, and there were barbarians at the gates, and life just did not seem to hold much hope for many people. And they, they wanted order in their lives, and he, he gave this to them. He gave them a structured community in which they could live, and they could live their faith with one another. And over the past several weeks, I've talked with you about worship, study, serving, giving, and last Sunday, sharing, especially sharing our faith. And I would love to remind you there are some little items on the table as you're going out of the sanctuary into the narthex. If you have not gotten one, please get one. There's a key, chain, a key holder, a key tag, excuse me, that has on it these topics that we've been talking about. And there's a little card also that talks about them and it encourages you to do certain things, certain acts each week of showing kindness, of sharing with others, acts of service. And it encourages you to invite someone to come and worship with you. That is one of the most important things that we as believers can do besides in some way sharing our faith with them that they might become a believer in Jesus Christ. So keep these things in mind over the week as we move toward Easter, but first we have to get through Monday, Thursday, and that Friday that is called Good, and remember all that Christ did. And today I will be talking very specifically about Christ himself from a passage of Scripture that is, is quite well known. It is labeled and entitled in many places in Bibles as talking about the attitude of Christ. Really, it, if you look at the, the Greek, the mind of Christ is a better translation that we are called to have the mind of Christ. And this verse encapsulates the humility by which Christ lived, and that was also one of the important aspects of Benedict's rule and order, that you were to be humble that you were not to think more of yourself than you should. And, you know, some of these things, as I read them, I found them quite interesting. I also found them like, uh, as something, boy, I could see instituting these things today, where he writes, individual desires have no place in the monastery, and neither inside nor outside the wall should anyone presume to argue with the abbot. That was the person that's kind of over things. If he dares do so, he should be punished according to the rule. Now, it also talks in here about punishment, and it says that if someone is stubborn, maybe the punishment should be a bit more severe. And they were talking about punishment. They weren't talking about putting you in the corner. Uh, they were talking about getting a strap and taking some hide off of you. I guess whipping you for Jesus. But I don't know that we could quite go that far today that that would be recommended. But it is recommended that we do keep in mind humility, humbleness. And, you know, it's, it's probably not the easiest thing in the world because I would imagine that there are many people that may think a little more of themselves than they should. My mama would always say, you're getting too big for your britches, that you're thinking, you know, that you're a little higher than you should be and we expect the world to hand us things. I laughed at a, a little story. It talked about a, a man coming home after a, just a grueling day at work. He plopped himself down on the couch, and he began to just wallow in his self-pity. Now, have you ever done that? Have you ever done any wallowing? 
you know, when you just, things aren't going well, <laughs> aren't going well, and you're just like, oh, woe, oh, woe is me. And he moaned to his wife that nobody cares about me. In fact, the whole world hates me. And his wife, without losing a beat, just replied, that's not true, dear. The whole world couldn't possibly hate you because most of them don't even know you. And that would be the case. Humility is often probably found at home first and foremost before anywhere else. And it's difficult because I don't know many people that love to eat humble pie when it comes down to it. Yet I want you to hear today from the book of Philippians. This passage of scripture that has been referred to as a Christological hymn from the early church. Starting in verse 5 of chapter 2. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So today we're going to talk about the pattern for walking on this journey that we call a Christian life. That as I have talked about walking, walking in worship, walking in study, walking while serving, walking in giving and sharing while walking over the past several weeks, and I've wanted you to think about this life we live as a journey. Today, I want you to think about the pattern or guide for our journey, our walking. And it's just been given to us in a very succinct manner by the Apostle Paul in this passage. And I'm not going to try and just break it down individually because as I read several um, commentaries and articles about this passage, it talked about you really need to take it as a whole because of the message that is there. And there's an overarching message. And Paul also had a reason for sending this to the Philippians. He loved the church in Philippi. It was the church where the first European convert occurred. So it held a special place in his heart. Yet there were some difficulties because it talks of individuals in the congregation not being of the same mind that they had some disagreements, and this bothered him. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, there's a little secret that, that, that most pastors really, really find so wonderful when everybody gets along, <laughs> when the body of Christ acts as the body, cooperates, works together, and serves together. Yet Paul realized that there were some powers working against the body, powers maybe outside of the church that were causing difficulties within the church. And you know, that can happen, that can happen very easily with us today. We can allow the world to affect the body. We bring all this mess from outside, inside with us, and it starts creating issues. So we have to be careful. If we're going to follow the pattern that's given to us, if we're going to have the same mind as Christ that was shown to us here, the Christ that came to us, who emptied himself fully, becoming human, yet divine at the same time, suffering for our sakes, dying but with great humility. And that is a word I want us to really think about this morning. Humility. When you think of humility, what does it bring to mind for you? <clears throat> because in the ancient world, you might find this interesting. You may have already known this. But the Greeks, and later the Romans... 
They did not consider humility a virtue. They did not look upon it in a positive manner. But they felt that humility was something that you should be ashamed of. That you should not seek to be humble. Humilitas in the Greek, excuse me, in the Latin, sorry, meant something like being crushed or debased. So they saw humility as weakness. Now, there was only one kind of humility that was viewed as good, and that was humility before the gods, little g. That you should have humility before them. But you should not be expressing humility before others, especially anyone of lower rank than you. If someone was beneath you, now I'm not saying we should feel this way, then you should not show humility. And where they thought humility was weakness, they looked in other directions because they loved to praise themselves in public and loved to get praise from others that they would say you cannot have a humble heart or a humble nature and expect expect to have a good life. Now, humility was embarrassing, but something of the greatest value was honor. They prized it above all else. Of course, how are you going to define being honorable? That's subjective, and what causes a person to be honorable? They didn't like humility, but they liked honor. And so, this was a part of the underlying culture that made it so difficult in the minds of some to wrap themselves around the person of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ was the epitome of humility. He was equal with God, yet did not view himself in that manner. He was fully divine, yet embraced his full humanity. Now let's be hypothetical for a moment. And let's think about this. If, if we somehow were to come to the understanding that in our humanity, we also had divine powers. How would that be? How would that play out? How would we act if we could do anything we wanted? I think it'd be dangerous. Because I don't know that we would control our humanity as Christ did in so many situations and in so many places. We would just, I want this. I want that. I don't like that person. Zap. Could you imagine how things would be? But Christ came into this world emptying himself, it says, fully so that he could bless us and watch over us and that the world would be reconciled to God through Christ. Now, don't know about you, but in our modern world, I would say that there's also a, an underlying current where, where many don't, don't view humility probably with the greatest, the greatest desire or the greatest admiration as well. I, and believe me, I, I do not watch as many sports as I once did. My most favorite probably is college football. I love to watch college football and other college sports. I've, I got burned out on professional sports a long time ago, and this is in no way an indictment. I mean, those, those people have skills and abilities that I could never have. I mean, you could try to work hard, but there's, a, there's some that just have natural ability, and there's some that work really hard to get that. But one of the things that really turns me off so many times, and these are the individuals that 
much of society looks to as role models or as the ones to give us a guide how we should act, what we should do, if you will watch them after they score or after they have a big play, you know, some of their actions, and I see it most of the time on Sports Center or something like that because I just don't sit and watch the games. I'm like, well, he's really happy with himself. And it's usually not just that thing that they do, but then they're taunting the other players. It's like, ha, I did that to you. You're not as good as I am. It's hard to find humility as an overarching understanding in our society. Now, there are some, some professional players that, that I think seem to display excellent sportsmanship, so I'm not trying to shoot them all down. It's just my concern that when we have an entire society that looks to a group as their guide, you have to be careful. They, not just some professional athletes, but, but those in the entertainment and film industry or those in the music industry. They're looked to as, oh, this is somebody I have to emulate because they're famous, because they have a lot of money, because they seem to be able to do whatever they want, and then they do whatever they want. And in this modern day of mass media, you can't do anything without it being seen, because everybody is a reporter because they're walking around with one of these that has a camera on it and so if anything happens it's automatically you know they're videoing it for the world to see and once it's posted online it is in that stratosphere and it is never removed ask those people that have gone for job interviews and someone happens to look on one of their social media pages and see something and they don't get a position because of something they did and they were smart enough to post it online. Humility is something that stands against all that this world seems to tell us. So how do, how do we feel about it? Well, we have a Savior who exemplified it for us and showed us that that is that is the way that we should be. But yet, we struggle. We battle internally. We battle each other. When you're in a conversation, the vast majority of the time, if you think about it, and you're discussing something, and let's just say by chance, because it doesn't seem to happen much today, that two of you have differing opinions. We know that's not very usual anymore. That we all see eye to eye and we just get along and we are just happy, happy, joy, joy, you know. But just say you're discussing something. And, and you realize as you're going back and forth, well, they don't think the way I think. Okay. I would just accept that, embrace them, and love them. No, that's not what we think. I've got to change their mind. Rescue them from this ignorance in which they live. Well, Christ, he, he desired to rescue us all. And that's what the Apostle Paul states to us, to have the same mind as Christ Jesus. And if we are to do that, it means that we will look at the world in a very different way. That we will look at it not so much as what can this world do for me, but what is it that I as a believer can do for this world? Because we have so much to give. We have Jesus Christ. If he is your Lord and Savior, then you have him to share. And are we willing? Are we willing to, to share and to do that because Christ... In his humility, what was he willing to do? He was willing to give it all. He gave his life for our sakes. That we might be saved from that which enslaves us. Sin. 
And we're told, of course, in the Scripture itself, in the Gospel of John, in the 15th chapter, the 13th verse, no greater love has anyone than this, to lay down their life for a friend. To lay down your life for another person. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm sure thinking, hey, now if you're saying for me to lay down my life, I'm not so sure, but Christ laying down his life, that's good. Yeah, you go right ahead, Jesus. You're the man. But if it were asking of us to make an ultimate sacrifice, where would we come down? There's a beautiful story that I want to, I want to close with this morning. This story has been with me for many years. I shared it in the first sermon that I ever preached in the church where I grew up. They invited me back for a a student Sunday while I was in school. And I remember learning about this and studying for the sermon and finding a story about a gentleman named Father Damien. He was a missionary to the Hawaiian Islands. And this was during the 1800s. And on the island of Molokai, there was a leper colony. Anyone that was found to have leprosy was taken from the main main islands and the main settlements and placed on this island with all the other lepers because there was no, no healing for it. It was very contagious. We read about it throughout the scriptures. And they were just left there in their misery to slowly and eventually die. Well, Father Damien learned of this, and he felt compelled by God to go and minister to these these individuals battling leprosy. So he went. He nursed them. He gave them water when they could not give water to themselves. He fed them. He cleaned their wounds. And he shared the love of Christ with them until he himself developed leprosy and eventually he died. Now think about that. That is an ultimate example of laying down your life in serving the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yeah, I'm not sure that that's something many of us are quite ready to jump up and say. Yeah, yeah. Please ask me to do that. And I don't share that to make us feel guilty. I don't share that to make us feel bad. I I share that to say that Christ is the ultimate example. The guide and the pattern that is shown to us that we are to try our best to follow. Today, are are you willing to follow him? even when the path is not easy. Because we go from the greatest joy of today, Palm Sunday, to the tragedy of Good Friday, just a matter of days. Ask your heart as we prepare to sing our hymn, Where is my humility in the face of this world? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you for this day and for the excitement of remembering Christ as he entered Jerusalem, as the crowds cheered for him, but sadly the cheering stopped, and even those who were considered his dearest friends would would forsake him. And as we prepare to journey this week, remind us of Christ and his sacrifice, and as we prepare our hearts to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we will remember that which he did for us. Now speak to us as we prepare to lift our voices. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
please be seated. I ask you now to prepare your hearts for this time of celebrating the Lord's Supper. And may the mind of Christ be in you as we celebrate this holy meal. In the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 3 through 11, or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when he died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we die with Christ, we know we also will live with him. We are sure of this. Because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin, and alive to God through Christ Jesus. We gather here around the Lord's table observe the Lord's Supper because we have been called out of the darkness into God's light. This table is open to all who love the Lord, have confessed their need of God's saving mercy, and accepted Him as their Savior, professing Him as Lord. We invite you to come to it, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are worthy, but because he loved you and gave his life for you. Not because you are strong, but because you confess weakness and gather with those of like mind that see the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And when he had given thanks... He said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Please join me in prayer. We thank you, dear Lord, as our Heavenly Father, for this table to which we have come and all that it means in our journey in your earthly kingdom. We thank you for your Son, our Savior, whose body was broken on our behalf and whose blood was shed for our sins. Grant that these elements we share may speak to us with freshness of him who, though he died, was victorious over the grave and now lives forevermore. Help us to know that because he lives, we too will live, and we will receive the power to overcome the darkness that surrounds us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Taking the bread and sharing it with his disciples. Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Take, eat in remembrance of Christ, and may his life be also in us. Take and eat. And in the same manner, taking the cup after blessing it, Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Let us drink this cup in remembrance of Christ, and may the spirit in which he died 
be our spirits. Take and drink. Please stand to receive the commission and blessing. And please respond as so indicated. May the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, the one who never turned back in defiance, the one who gave his back to the lash, the one who faced spitting and insult. May your bearing be that of Christ Jesus the one who emptied himself, the one who took the form of a servant, the one who was raised to the heights and given the name above all names. May your lives declare the lordship of Jesus Christ to the glory of God as we begin the journey of Holy Week. Blessed be the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen.